read uh, for you a section from Second uh, Peter. It's a letter that Peter wrote, and uh, here's how he ends it. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by God at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, speaking of these as he does in all of his letters. There are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do with all of the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, since you are forewarned, beware that you are not carried away with the air of the lawless and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. We live in an unprecedented time. Does anyone want to say amen? amen. <laughs> but we also live in a time of great opportunity as a church. Because we are a people who are coming together in a brand new way. And in that sense, we are reforming, right? Whatever way we're going to come together in the new normal, we're going to be formed differently than we were before. It's going to be a different shape, right? So in that sense, we will be a reformed people. We have a long tradition as Protestants of Reformation. Part of being Protestant, by the way, if you've ever thought of this, you ever wonder why church people can be so ornery? <laughs> I actually think it's a family trait. Because the word Protestant comes from protest, ant, Protestant. That's where we get our name. That's like our family heritage. We're troublemakers. And we're always working for the greater good. And we always think there's room for improvement. And that sets us apart because we're not purely conservative. We're not trying to conserve some fire of the past and to keep those embers alive and to only celebrate what has happened in the past. As Protestants, we are always looking because we know that there's room for improvement. So for instance, as Methodists, we don't just celebrate that we were great in some previous era, say the 1950s, when we became the main line of the denominations, right? We were the largest denomination in America Right? We don't just celebrate the glory of the past in some sort of decline narrative. We also just don't talk about the good old days of the 1700s with the Wesley brothers. Right? We know that God is doing something today. And the Lord is at work among us. And that God's spirit is active in us as believers and in us as a congregation and in us as a denomination. And we know that we are called to work for the greater good because we always think there's room for improvement. But one of the things I have grown weary of is how often church programs or spiritual enterprises start with the word R-E revival, religion, reform, right? Reclaim this truth. So many of our projects are about something to do with the past, the re. And I get that because without the road that has delivered us here, we wouldn't be here. So I, I get that that's a part of it. But what I'm finding helpful is to put a bracket around the RE, to bracket it off, partition it, compartmentalize it to the side and say, when we think about ourselves, how we're called into the world, what God wants to do with us these days, how do we conceptualize that? And so by bracketing the RE, what I'm learning to do is to ask three different questions. How have we been formed? By what are we informed? And to what are we looking to transform? So instead of reform, I talk about formed, informed, and transformed. So I'm going to give you three examples. By what have we been formed? 
I grew up a pastor's kid in the free Methodist. Not I, We weren't united, we were free. I still don't know if it's better to be united or free. It's a debate. <laughs> but I have been formed by the Methodist methods, the practices of Methodism. We're sitting here by a labyrinth. We sing these hymns. We pray together. We gather for worship. We serve our community. Those practices have formed me have made me who I am, have not left me alone to just be whatever version of myself I would be without those practices. I have been formed by being a part of a congregation to listen to people of different generations, to take seriously the experience of people who don't look like me or act like me, who don't think like me. I have been formed by being a part of multi-generational, multi-racial congregations it has changed me and who I am. I am a different shaped person. My heart is a different shape because I have been formed by being a part of a congregation and by doing the practices of the faith. I'm grateful for that. So that's my example, how I've been formed. By what are we informed? Well, a lot of you are informed by MSNBC and that's fine, that's fine, that's one source of information. A lot of you are formed, uh, informed by NPR. That's another good source of information. Some of you read The Oregonian. All good stuff. Here's the thing. We have this neat little thing in our tradition called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. And it says there are four sources of information that we look to. First is the scripture. Second is to the tradition. The third is to our experience. And the fourth is to reason. So in this sense, these four things really inform us. Scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. And I love that. To be informed by these multiple streams makes me a richer person and a better thinker. To not get bogged down in the either or us versus them thinking that plagues our culture. And when we talk about what are we imagining of being transformed into? I dream of a beloved community that Dr. King talked about. I dream of a common good where people don't fall through the cracks by the systems and policies that we've set up where no one, especially the most vulnerable and marginalized, are left unaccounted for. I dream of a social web where we're all made better, where people can use their strengths to help us in our weakness, and we're all nourished by participating together in a common cause. We have an opportunity as a church, as a congregation, and as believers, because our society in one sense, has sort of come to a stall. It has paused globally. We've been distanced. We've been isolated. We've been quarantined. <laughs> but we are reforming. And as we come back together and the groups that you participate in, whether it's Habitat for Humanity or getting people registered to vote, or your neighborhood Saturday night dinner, whatever it is, we are reforming. So I just wanted to take a minute and say, let's think together. Let's dream together to say when we reform, how do we want to do that? Because things don't have to be the way they were. That's the magic of our moment. We don't, we're not limited in this time to making minor adjustments to the established way things are. We can dream bigger dreams. We can live into different realities. We can have different conversations with our neighbors and our communities and our neighborhoods because it's a time of reform. We're coming back together. I just want to ask the question, how do you want to come back together? What do you want to be the priority? What would you invest in if you really thought it would bear good fruit? So I'm going to sit with that for a second. I'd like to ask you to just think with me. 